Hello, and welcome to today's session, The Five Orchestrator Challenges You May Not Know About. We're joined by Rain and Zakir from ISP3, who will be telling us more about a few challenges that we've come across in our experience with orchestrators so far. Take it away, Rain and Zakir. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rain Dalton, and I'm glad you can all join us for today's short presentation covering a few challenges that we faced with Orchestrator, and we believe the JDE community can benefit off. I'll be introducing our two presenters, myself and Zakir Cater. Then I'll be running through five challenges that we face with Orchestrator, a use case and scenario for that challenge, the issue specifically with a challenge that we needed to resolve, and our solution to it. And at the end, I'll do a quick summary of recent orchestrator enhancements with 924. So again, my name is Rain Dalton. I'm a developer. I've been uh, with JD Edwards for six years, and throughout I've been developing with embedded BI publisher solutions, and the past year and a bit been diving into solutions with orchestrator development. With me today as well, and taking a back seat for any of these Technical questions that may come up for our end is Zakir Cater, a technical area specialist with ISP3 Solutions. He has 23 years JDE, uh, JDE experience and has been working with Orchestrator since its release. So he's been working through all three generations, uh, the initial basic AIS installation, the second iteration using components, which will look familiar in today's images, and the newer third generation with the interactive graphical flows. So let's dive in. The five orchestrator challenges that uh, we faced, and um, for each, again, I'll talk a bit about the requirement or the use case that led to that challenge, specifically what the issue is and how we navigated that challenge to develop a solution. Uh, please be advised that these range in level of technicality. Also, the solutions we looked at here were project appropriate. Groovy and the underlying Java is very powerful and allow for various approaches to these challenges. And that's what makes Orchestrator so much fun. Uh, for these five challenges, we're looking at updating JDE tables directly and cross environment database connections. And these will look uh, at and refer to some Groovy code as a solution. We'll be looking at UNC paths as variables and the orchestrator scheduler uh, as more generic challenges that have come up that anyone may face. And we just want to bring awareness to its operation and how you can navigate some of these that come up. And lastly, debugging when an orchestration errors. We provide some information on how to use the orchestrator components to help resolve what the issue is. Okay, so first off, updating JDE tables directly. So a use case or scenario that came up was that we have an orchestration for business automation. We have external data that needs to be processed into JDE, but we're not using a whitelist to do a pure true-false filter. We want the data to come in, and then we want to um, evaluate that data, checking for errors, and log them in custom JDE tables. In those tables will later then be used for error reporting. So a real real world scenario here. The issue is that we're not using an interactive application that's available for the error checking of the data or updating uh, to the table in JDE. What we're using are these custom JDE tables that are uh, utilizing SQL statements for those direct updates. And as what comes with the different databases that throughout the lifecycle, they are using different schemas. So the SQL statements need to accommodate those schemas through the environments, DV, PY, and production. And these would be pretty standard requirements for a project with this solution, if you're using these SQL statements. So here's what we did. So we looked at Groovy to resolve this issue for us. Uh, we have a simple custom service request with Groovy code to retrieve the environment for the orchestration that's being run in. So in that first graphic, uh, second line, 
you can see that we're using the orc atter.get environment. So that's a built-in uh, library and um, statement to get the environment that the orchestration is being run in. And we can then use that variable to pass through child orchestrations. And secondly, we also in Groovy, it helps us build the proper dynamic SQL statements. So we have an array with the schemas for the database tables. And then we can use a condition to select the proper element within that array uh, for dynamic SQL building. In the third image there, you can see that we have a SQL statement referencing variables, but that SQL statement then would not need to change since we're basing the, the schemas from the environment. So this allows us to use this uh, already created Groovy code throughout the environments and it'll only update and read data as it needs to. Now, almost as a step two to the previous challenge, but rightfully a challenge on its own, we have a challenge where we have a database connection being used across these environments in JDE. So again, we're using custom tables that are updated with SQL statements and not an interactive application. And we're using this SQL code in a database connector service request. In those components, you select the database connection to use. Now the issue is that with the database connector, it's going to be used and tested across the life cycle of this orchestration of the project. So we need to ensure that we're using environment appropriate connections. And instead of having a connection called DVCon for, for the dev environment, uh, only available in the dev, and then when we push it to user testing or production, we'll need to change that, which it's not feasible to then push it back to DV, change that connector, database connection, push it forward and, and test it. That's a terrible practice. So how we approach this was a simple but sweet solution. We create the soft coding for the database connection, connections in the web service soft coding records program, P95-4000. But uh, as you can see from this graphic here, the, the grid there, the soft coding key column, we're using the same name, dbcon. Um, for the different environments. So for DV and for PY and eventually production, they're all named dbcon. So in the second graphic here, we can see when we're creating the database connector service request, we're selecting the connection to use. We're using a database connection and we're selecting the dbcon. That'll be the only one available because it's looking at, if we're developing DV here, looking at what's available in DV and there will only be the dbcon available for that environment. So it, when we then do push it forward to PY, it will look for dbcon, and in PY we'll have one that's respectively built for the connection and the security for that environment. So it will use the appropriate one in the respective environment. And this is great because it allows the proper JDE security and control over the access of those connections per environment. Uh, if you were to, again, select one specifically named for that environment, you'd have to push it back and forth, and that becomes a bit <laughs> not a good practice. Okay, so moving on to our third challenge. This uh, scenario or use case, we have a daily automation uh, requirement, an orchestration that's run daily. A new employee's file, for example, is stored on a network directory and is accessed with a UNC path. It is accessed daily. The file is checked uh, if it exists or if it's a CSV file, if the header is, is correct and um, matches what we require. And then we read every line uh, within that CSV file checking for errors. Errors are logged and then a notification is sent at the end, whether there was errors uh, or if it proceeded without any errors and everything was updated correctly. So a pretty standard real-world scenario here that you need to look through the data before you're 
dumping it in. To add a wrinkle, the development was for this orchestration was done off-site and then imported with OMW Web, approved and shared as per the uh, standard UDO deployment and management process. So the issue here specifically is that the off-site development environment uses a Linux operating system where the AIS was installed on. The client AIS is installed on a Windows operating system. So we're using UNC paths here and using them in variables to be passed throughout the different components and sub-orchestrations. But the issue is here that with the different operating systems, paths are um, of a different structure. And we have an un unexpected effect on the value of that variable as it gets passed between the orchestrator components. We're using backslashes for these paths in Windows versus the forward slashes in Linux which, okay, that could be a simple change in your code. However, a backslash in Groovy and most scripting languages is used to escape special characters. So if you have a full path for a server, you have backslash, backslash, and the server name. However, since we're escaping and using it, it becomes four backslashes to be read as two. <laughs> and an added effect of this is that as you're passing this variable from a parent orchestration calling into sub orchestrations and using it into these orchestrations for specific jobs, for example, making sure we can read the file and then an orchestration to read and, and log errors and a third sub orchestration to actually process it once it's uh, valid or only the valid ones. If you're passing that variable through, it escapes those characters and your four backslashes become two and become one which is not a valid path, so it breaks. So how do we look at resolving this fancy issue? Well, a long-winded explanation of the issue that's really solved in a, a few basic steps. Now, these steps would ideally be isolated, and, and we have done so in our solution, isolated in, our, in their own mini orchestration. And this orchestration is used to retrieve the appropriate UNC path for the environments. Of course, we have different paths for different environments. So in our first graphic here, you can see that we're storing the path itself in full UNC per environment in the uh, business service cross-reference table, P95-2000. <clears throat> we then use a cross-reference component, an orchestrator component, pretty basic one. We have an environment that we're using to draw the environment appropriate UNC path. So we can use the previous get environment groovy code that we saw in the JDE uh, table update solution to drive this. We can get the environment, pass it into this cross-reference uh, orchestration component, pull the proper UNC path. Now this is great because again, you can build this into a mini orchestration and use it as needed. So initially we looked at putting this at the parent orchestration and then having that variable defined once and passing it through orchestration outputs and orchestration inputs. However, as I mentioned before, they do get read and processed and the backslashes get escaped. So here we can have the small orchestration used at, uh, at an orchestration level where we need it. So if we have an orchestration to see if the file exists, we can quickly call this one with these three steps and use it at that level only. Then the next orchestration to see what the errors are and log them for the line, quickly call this orchestration and so on. So a pretty, you know, only a few steps, pretty basic to do so and a pretty standard solution, but it's a pretty useful one to utilize these JD components and orchestration components to use them at that level. A fourth challenge that we saw is a pretty basic challenge with orchestrator scheduler and, and one that most would face when you have a orchestration um, run daily. So just a, a scenario here, daily automation again, we have a orchestration that processes new metrics from equipment at 5 p.m. The, these metrics are gathered 
and generated from an external system and they create a CSV file with these new metrics. And then we need to read that file and process it into JDE. So not talking about the orchestration itself, but more so the fact that this runs daily. So we have an orchestration with a schedule assigned to it and we have that deployed, but now what? It's not kicking off. We need to use the orchestrator scheduler to actually do that. So we know, so our issue here and our challenge is that we, we know we need to start the scheduler and this is prior to 9.2.4 and we'll talk about that at the end here of, of some enhancements it brought. We know we need to start the scheduler and have this job run. We know that we're using a REST client for these commands, but how? How do we actually do this? And here's a, a link to an official Oracle document on the endpoints. I have it again on the next slide a little bigger as well. So we have a REST, REST client installed uh, on the AS server and we decided to go with SOAP UI, but you can use Postman or any other REST client. Uh, here are the, the commands, the three basic steps. And this is just to bring awareness to the, the operation of these commands and, and what they can really do. Uh, improvements later on in 9.2.4 uh, allow you to automate this and click uh, to have this done. But it's really good to bring awareness to them so you know what they are and how to use them. And knowledge of this can definitely help your understanding of the new scheduler improvements as well. So first off, we have a command to grab a token. Now, a token is a unique string that's built with credentials into it. So we're grabbing this token request uh, based off of a user and it's, and that user's password, that those credentials, uh, which will allow us to execute subsequent REST commands using that authentication. So we grab a token first generated with this level of authentication. Second, we have the start command. Uh, in this command, you can see we have JDE REST and V2 for version two, and that's the, uh, the base URL endpoint that we'll be using for all of these. Uh, in this one, you can see we're using scheduler slash start. And we're using that token that was generated from the previous one to do so. So we're using that authentication to start the scheduler. And our third uh, command here is we have scheduler start job and then the object name. And that's the, the UDO object name for the orchestration. Again, we're using the token with our authentication here to start that. And this code here is to start an individual job. We're adding that individual job to the scheduler. There are other commands um, at that link below there that you can go see and you can start the scheduler and all associated orchestrations or notifications that have schedules associated with them. Right? Here we're just starting it and doing that specific one. Um, on, on the right side here, you can see some other useful commands. Uh, so this would take uh, the last part of the scheduler slash command here. We have discover, which allows you to see which orchestrations and notifications are available to be started and added. They have the schedules added to them. We have stop scheduler, which self-explanatory stops the scheduler. No, no more will run. And a very useful list command that will list the orchestrations and notifications assigned and currently running with the scheduler, when they were started up, their next fire time, the schedule um, and cron string, which is the uh, piece of code that depicts, that dictates the timing of that schedule. You can see all of that useful information per orchestration and notification. And it's very useful to see if it started, when it last run, why didn't it run? Um, you can see some exceptions there as well. So just wanted to bring awareness to that. The orchestrator scheduler was an interesting, um, but uh, interesting challenge, but one that most will face when they're trying to start the scheduler. And finally, our, our final challenge and one used throughout development of orchestrations, um, again, improved with the newer versions, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Debugging when an orchestration errors. Um, uh, we have a, a multi-part complex orchestration, several components, a parent calling several sub-orchestrations to accommodate a project requirement. And we're adding a, specifically for this, we're adding 
a database connector for the SQL query to a JDE table, like we've done before. However, the issue is that uh, we're using Orchestrator Client to test this, and we're getting a JavaScript exception or general errors. Um, and that's as expected. You can't read your mind and know exactly what you're trying to do and tell you where the issue is. It's going to tell you where the code broke and what led to that breaking. But if you have a complex orchestration, it breaking and ending, it doesn't necessarily give you all the information on what data you've, you've pumped through, what was being evaluated, and, and what the output is. We just know that it ended. So we want to evaluate the values and debug this. So we've got three slides for this. Um, so first here we have the component. We have a, a custom service request, uh, sorry, a database connector service request called condbtest. And we run it with a SQL statement and we get this error. It's a generic error, uh, message is null, no user defined error. Okay, and we can look at the or orchestrator exceptions, P980060 uh, lines there, and we can see the same exception message. This orchestration, UDO name, broke here, service request, there's no message. Okay, well, we want to figure out why. Well, first thing what we did to navigate this is we added a new component as the first step of the orchestration, wherein we defined the variable for the SQL string in Groovy. Um, Akina, I can see exactly where the issue is already, but we'll <laughs> highlight that at the end. We have this variable here so that we can push it out on the return map of that step and allow the orchestration to have it as an output in the client. So on our second graphic here, we're actually making sure that we check that in the service request, we're having that as the output. And in the third step here, we're using the orchestrator error handling and we're setting it to continue on the error so that it doesn't just end because uh, we need to maybe continue on this and send a notification or email as a final step that there was an error. We don't just want the orchestration to stop and not finish the task. Uh, so with those three parts implemented, we have on the left side the previous error and on the right side the new uh, error output from the uh, orchestrator client. Whereas before it was pretty generic, there's no message, there's an error. Here on the on the right side, we see our SQL string. That was the actual string that we were trying to execute. And we can see that we're, from, you know, syntactically that's incorrect. Select needs a T. So that's not going to work. We see that we continued on the error. Uh, we still have the generic error message, which was the, the exception to it. But with our user defined error text, it gives us a little bit more information and somebody was debugging it, a little bit more information on where it actually broke. And those are our five challenges we faced. Just a quick summary uh, of some recent orchestrator enhancements that came out in 9.2.4. So two of these, the scheduler and the debugging um, with flow and everything actually do get enhanced as well. But here are some four major enhancements. The, the orchestrator studio design itself has a new design where you have a top level view when you're launching it, you can immediately see and access interactively the, the new components. You have this interactive flow visual uh, where all these components are nicely lined out in a, in a flow view, and you can click and dive in to those um, components. And also you can execute directly from the Orchestrator Studio instead of having your second URL there for the Orchestrator client and, and running it from there. Here you can actually run it right there as you're developing. And second, there's some uh, UI improvements for Orchestrator Scheduler. So though we've, we've talked about it here and brought some awareness on how that operates, the new one allows you to monitor your, your um, Orchestrator schedules, see what's running and when it last, last ran. You can set up some auto start for the schedulers and um, click and start and stop them. The third uh, improvement is grid support for orchestrations. This is a form extensibility improvement, but uh, in 9.2.3.3, there was an introduction to launch orchestrations from an application form. In 9.2.4, there was additional capabilities enabling the orchestrations to run iteratively over selected rows in a grid. 
and to map that data between the header and the grid fields. So it considerably reduces repetitive tasks of editing grid records annually. And fourth, the deployment and security enhancements. Uh, the uh, orchestrator is now deployed and bundled with the AIS server. Previously, Studio required deployment to, to the WebLogic server within a um, development framework environment, ADF. So now it's deployed as a component of AIS server and available through URL endpoints to that server. Also, the orchestrator inherits AIS server certificates. So once it's de deployed on that server, those certificates are available for your secure protocols. And finally, uh, some some simplified security. It uses the standard JD Edwards Enterprise One application security. Um, there's no need to add users to the AIS whitelist. It now fits in with that standard application security. So a lot cleaner and, and uh, standardized management there. Okay, great. Thanks, Reen. Um, we have received a question, uh, if you or Zakir don't mind answering. Um, so uh, do you guys have any experience using third-party Groovy libraries? And can you tell us of a use case? Yes, uh, absolutely. Zakir, if you want to uh, uh, talk to that, I can pass it off to you. Sure. Uh, yeah, we got, uh, I'll explain a couple of uh, use cases. So one of the use cases was to use uh, Excel spreadsheets within, uh, you know, through the orchestrator, how to process them. You know, currently, as you guys know, we it is capable of uh, using X, uh, CSV files through STP protocol, but uh, there is no direct link to Excel files, but there are third-party Groovy uh, libraries available. You can make use of those and you can process the Excel files uh, within Groovy. And the second one was a very interesting one, which was a, uh, we had a request from a client. Uh, they have a, uh, they have certain files that reside on a FTP server. Uh, we need to bring down that through the orchestrator. So the challenge was currently JDE support with a username and a password for the FTP site. Unfortunately, this FTP site was set up with a, private key and uh, with the fast phrase, uh, you know, that mechanism. So again, we had to use another third party uh, Groovy library in order to uh, use that uh, FTP site, the SFTP site. So there are, there are libraries available. You can make use of those libraries. Only thing is there is a bit of a, a CNC a task involved setting up the library on the back end uh, in your AIS server. Once that library has been set up, uh, you are free to use it inside Groovy and uh, you can perform the task. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing those cases, Zakir. Um, so that's all of the questions for right now. If you do have any further questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and also make sure to visit our website for more on Orchestrator, as well as the ISP3 Orchestrator Library. Uh, once again, we thank you all for taking the time to join us for this session, and we hope that you have a great rest of your day.